you quickly introduce uh, nothing much. Uh, Robert Lofton is here. He's from University of Sheffield. He's an assistant professor in machine learning there. Yeah. And we are great. We are inclusive learning, negotiation, and cooperation in differential games. The stage is yours. Nice. Okay, so, so um, yeah, as you said, I'm, I'm uh, Robert Lofton from Sheffield. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work I've done with uh, with <coughs> Sammy and with, um, with Mert, who's also on the call on uh, uh, multi-agent learning in uh, what are called differentiable games. Um, the first one I want to talk a little bit about is the... You might want to move this in the A lot. Yes. A lot of the slide. Let's see if that goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the motivations behind our work. So one of the things we're really interested in is uh, the question of achieving ad hoc cooperation um, between uh, uh, humans and AIs and between heterogeneous uh, AI agents. And what we mean by ad hoc here is that um, the agents uh, basically don't know anything about each other. They don't know about their underlying learning algorithms. They don't necessarily know about one of those goals, but they still need to cooperate. Um, and this raises some important uh, conceptual questions like um, uh, what are safe assumptions I can make about other agents? Um, or even what does it mean to uh, succeed in cooperating with another, with another agent in an ad hoc setting? Um, and so I think it's, uh, I think most people would agree that the ability to um, um, cooperate with uh, humans and with other agents is uh, a critical skill or is going to be a critical skill uh, for AI systems deployed in the real world. Um, and indeed, there's been the, the, in the past few years, there's been kind of a surge of, uh, of research on um, uh, practical approaches to ad hoc cooperation. Um, mostly built around uh, deep reinforcement learning um, and even uh, a few dedicated uh, reinforcement learning environments um, like Overcooked and uh, uh, Hanabi set up specifically to study uh, ad hoc um, human AI cooperation. Um, but what's lacking is a solid theoretical and uh, conceptual understanding of the problem. And our kind of broader research agenda aims to uh, fill just this gap. So, before you can even talk about uh, theory and start getting into the math, um, there's a really fundamental conceptual question we have to ask. Um, so when we think about multi-agent systems, uh, when we typically think about multi-agent systems, we think about uh, other agents as being something separate from the shared environment through which we interact. So we reason about the world and we reason about other agents essentially separately. Um, but at the end of the day, other robots, if we're in a, an AI, AI, uh, AI interaction session, uh, setting or uh, human beings, they're all just physical objects. So a uh, very uh, natural question to ask is, why not just treat them all as part of the world? Um, and the problem is, uh, while we can treat them as part of the world, if we do that, uh, all of the nice theory that we have for single-agent reinforcement learning, so essentially the problem becomes a single-agent reinforcement learning problem, the problem of cooperation, um, all that nice theory applies, but unlike the environment, which is essentially the far from stationary, um, and we can actually lower and upgrade the model of it, uh, other agents have the ability, or at least we believe they have the ability, uh, to adapt to us uh, essentially as well as we can adapt to them. Um, and so all of our nice, uh, all the nice theory we have um, for um, um, single agent reinforcement learning uh, and uh, uh, machine learning kind of goes out the window. Um, and so we were in, so this uh, setting where you have multiple agents uh, simultaneously adapting to one another raises um, some kind of unique uh, theoretical questions, uh, probably the most basic of which is under what conditions will uh, agents that are learning simultaneously um, uh, converge to a cooperative solution? Um, and then a little more fundamentally, uh, we're going to answer that question is we have to answer uh, what notions of cooperation are achievable uh, when agents don't have the opportunity to um, uh, coordinate uh, their strategies in advance. Um, and so this talk is going to uh, look into these questions in the very specific context of um, uh, learning in differentiable games. So the rest of this talk um, will first uh, uh, discuss, discuss the idea of uh, learning to cooperate in repeated matrix games as kind of a, a primer. Um, then we'll go into some of the background on uh, differentiable games um, and uh, some learning algorithms, some 
uh, theory and some learning techniques that have been developed previously um, in the differentiable games in a number of different contexts. Um, we'll then get into this question of uh, coupled versus uncoupled learning, which is really the distinction between centralized versus ad hoc uh, cooperation. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, our very recent work um, uh, going to be appearing in the, the AMAS um, uh, a little later this year uh, on uh, uncoupled learning um, differentiable games, as well as uh, uh, role negotiation. So uh, we'll explain what that means a little later on. So uh, first off, um, I'm assuming most people are have at least some familiarity with uh, with game theory, and particularly with um, uh, matrix games. So here we have a very simple uh, uh, two by two matrix game, two player general sum matrix game, um, where the, uh, the the first in, the, in each of these squares, uh, the first payoff is um, the row player payoff, second payoff is the column player's payoff, and the task here. Um, is just to agree on a joint action. So either both players pick A or both players pick B. Um, and both players prefer, even if they have different uh, preferences. I've never seen anything like this. Can you please explain what is two comma one? What does that mean, A, A to comma? Yes, and, and please uh, feel free to, to speak up and ask questions. Um, so um, here, uh, this is a, we call the payoff matrix. So these are the uh, utilities that the player receives. So A and B here are actions um, that a player can choose. And here there are two players. So uh, both uh, the what we call the row player and the column player um, can choose either A or B, and their payoffs depend not only on their own actions, but on the action the other player chose. Um, and they choose these actions, and in the, the kind of standard setup, they choose these actions simultaneously, so they have to coordinate their actions. And then these uh, the, the the values in the um, in, this, in the matrix cells, these are um, the payoffs for individual players. So the uh, the first value is the payoff for the row player, um, so the player picking the row of the matrix. And the second value is the payoff for the uh, uh, column players, the player picking which column of matrix um, they get values from. And so what we're looking at, um, the, the, the setting we're really studying here is uh, repeated games. So they don't just play this once, they play this over and over and over again. And so uh, in principle, they have the opportunity to, um, um, to learn how to cooperate with one another. Um, but there's still a question of, uh, first, what constitutes um, um, Successful cooperation, um, and then of course, what uh, uh, what is a good strategy for the role player to follow? A good strategy over time for the role player to follow, even though they don't actually know what strategy and what um, what learning uh, more importantly, what learning update the column player is going to use. So, a pretty basic result is um, if people are familiar with uh, uh, online online prediction problems, the problem of um, learning. Uh, learning in a non-stationary setting, there are algorithms that are what we call Hanan consistent or no regret learning algorithms, which means that over time they do as well as the best strategy uh, they could have chosen, the best fixed strategy they could have chosen in hindsight. Um, and it's not, not usually important to, to understand for the rest of the talk, but one of the uh, uh, more basic results in the, in the theory of repeated games is that if you have two no regret learners um, pair against one another, uh, playing against one another um, in a repeated game, their um, joint strategy will eventually converge to what we call a course correlated equilibrium. Um, so their distribution of actions will converge to uh, a game, essentially a game theoretic solution um, to the uh, the stage game, so the individual game. Um, the problem in terms of uh, cooperation is that while we can show uh, convergence to um, not as a Nash equilibrium, but a, a course correlated equilibrium, which is a superset of the Nash equilibrium. Um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we'll successfully cooperate. So in this simple game, there is, um, so choosing AA and choosing BB uh, uh, with probability one are, um, are of course, course correlated uh, equilibria. Um, but so is each player choosing its preferred action, but with probability two thirds, um, which is uh, uh, far left, which is um, highly suboptimal for both players. It's Pareto dominated um, by both um, uh, coordinated outcomes, but it's still something that the uh, learners could in principle converge to. Hmm. What is a no regret learning rule? What is a course correlated equilibrium? So a no regret learning rule um, is essentially, it, it's any uh, learning algorithm. So any, uh, abstractly we can say it's a learning algorithm mapping from a history of actions to the strategy you're going to follow the next stage. But essentially it's a, it's a learning algorithm um, that takes the data online. We say no regret, we mean that um, so both players are playing a string of uh, essentially random actions. Um, and we say no regret, we mean that uh, in the limit, um, 
neither player will have preferred uh, to play any fixed action. So uh, the rogue player won't have preferred that in the past it had, preferred, it, it had played uh, action A for every single time step um, to the actions it actually played. Uh, at least by by a they prefer it, but only by a very they may prefer it, but only by a very small margin that goes to zero over time. Um, so you can so the, the best example is uh, uh, looking at um, stock predictions, so which is kind of where a lot of that work was motivated. Uh, where you have you know, different uh, uh, let's say mutual funds or stock brokers who you could um, that you could bet on, and the idea is that you want to do as well as you want to uh, hedge your bets so that you do as well as. The best worker you could have committed to from the beginning uh, over a long period of time, and there are algorithms that can actually um, do that, even if you don't know in advance um, what the market is going to do, and then you can't even be certain that a broker's uh, past performance is going to be indicative of their um, future performance. Um, and of course, that, of course, that's a, a very uh, uh, deep subject on its own. Um, so the main point here is that the uh, simultaneous learning. Um, if it converges, may converge to a non proper outcome. Um, so it suggests the need for maybe a different learning model uh, and potentially a different uh, uh, solution concept altogether. Um, so that brings us to what we call the uh, Sackleberg equilibrium. It was the Sackleberg optic model originally developed as a, a model of um, uh, market economics, um, assumes that players take turns. So there's a leader who chooses their strategy first and a follower who a selects that you presumably selects their best response to the strategy. Um, and, we'll, and this leads to what we call a Sackleberg solution with leader. Mm -hmm. Are you learning the payoff matrix at the same time as you're doing this? So in the matrix game setting, we're assuming uh, that you, we would assume that you know your payoff matrix, not the other players. Um, we have differentiable games. While you have access to your payoffs, you only have essentially a, a first order oracle. So you don't have to know the uh, complete structure of the payoff function initially. Um, so in that sense, you are actually learning your, uh, in a certain sense, you are actually learning your payoff function. Um, but so the Stackelberg solution is the strategy for the leader. So typically we'll assume the role player is the leader. It's the strategy for the leader that maximizes their own payoff, assuming that the follower, in this case, the column player, um, will select a, will always select the best response to their strategy. Um, and this turns out to be a, a relatively natural solution concept for um, cooperation, because of course, if you have a fully cooperative task, um, the uh, leader can simply choose their half of some jointly optimal strategy, and the follower will, will uh, best respond to that. But it also works even if you're in a um, uh, general sum game. Uh, so in this case, uh, the Sackleberg equilibria for the row player's leader uh, would be uh, choosing the actions AA because that's what the uh, that's the outcome that the uh, leader prefers. Um, but it is a uh, uh, Predo efficient that is it's not Predo dominated by any other uh, any other strategy. Um, so that's. Uh, uh, repeated matrix games in a nutshell, um, not really the focus of this talk. Uh, uh, and the reason we want to move on to these, uh, what we call differentiable games, is that uh, there are some things that are missing from uh, that we can't capture with the matrix game formalism. Um, one, of course, is that matrix games in the previous case, you just had two strategies, but it's generally so that you have small, finite strategy spaces. Um, and in realistic settings, your agents' uh, strategy spaces are going to be. Um, High dimensional policies. So typically, we interpret, we treat them as uh, the parameter. Their strategies are actually now the parameters of some neural network representing their control policy. Um, and uh, the, in matrix game, when you're assuming that the strategy space is very small, you're also assuming, um, as, as you were mentioning, the, the uh, uh, complete knowledge of the payoff function. You're assuming that the players can essentially engage in global optimization over their strategy space, um, uh, which isn't that which isn't necessarily realistic. Um, and it turns out the uh, dynamics that underlying optimization pro process can affect the, the shared learning dynamics. Um, so that motivates us to move on to, in addition to a lot of the nice theoretical results that are available in uh, differentiable games, um, motivates us to move to these, uh, 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 these things called differentiable games, which are a strict generalization of uh, the matrix games, as we'll see. Um, so formally, a differentiable game is just, a, 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 in this case, we'll just look at two-player games. Um, uh, a differentiable game is defined by uh, two payoff functions, uh, one for each player, um, and we simply assume that uh, these strategy spaces are now um, continuous and potentially high-dimensional um, vector spaces, uh, and the payoff functions, um, for it to be a different, differentiable game, they have to be differentiable with respect to uh, each player's payoffs, um, and uh, throughout this talk, we'll assume that they're actually twice continuously differentiable.
Um, and so we can actually describe any uh, 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 matrix game um, as a uh, as a differential game just by constraining the uh, strategy spaces to be the in-dimensional probability simplexes, and then defining the payoffs as the expected payoff under the joint strategy. Um, and so then that we're in a that we're dealing with differential cost functions, a uh, uh, very natural learning rule that we might that we might imagine uh, agents would follow is a gradient ascent on their individual costs. Um, and what we call simultaneous gradient ascent is where each player uh, performs gradient ascent on its own uh, payoffs, assuming that um, the uh, its partner will always follow the its most recent strategies. Their, their strategy is essentially static. And so we'll refer to that as SGA. Um, which also leads to a, a, a natural um, uh, extension of the idea of a Nash equilibrium, which referred to as differential Nash equilibrium. Um, so recall that a Nash equilibrium is, a, is essentially sort of in a matrix game is a, a joint strategy where neither player has an incentive to deviate unilaterally from that strategy. Uh, a differential, uh, differential Nash equilibrium uh, captures essentially the same idea in a differential game. Um, and so it's uh, a point where each player's uh, uh, individual payoffs are at an extreme uh, an extreme point. Um, then the uh, second condition on the uh, the, uh, uh, the second derivatives of the um, that's supposed to be a one actually uh, it's right here. But um, the condition on the second derivatives um, that simply requires that they uh, be local optima, not just the uh, extremal points of the uh, individual payoff functions. And so this is in a sense a local um, equivalent of an Nash equilibrium. So it's a, a joint strategy where. If players are constrained to an, uh, an infinitesimally small region around the strategy that they can make changes, uh, they would have no um, um, uh, incentive uh, to change their uh, to change their strategies. Um, and so, uh, uh, but I think about gradient uh, about simultaneous gradient descent is that uh, any differential uh, uh, Nash equilibrium uh, will be a stationary point of a uh, simultaneous gradient descent. Unfortunately, so when you say strategy x comma y in that inner product rotation, what you mean is a play like x equal to a, y equal to b. It's a point in the set of all actions. That's yeah, it's a point is a Nash equilibrium in a one and two as right? It's a pointwise property. Yeah, yeah. So it's a property of a, of a uh, joint strategy, which is a point in that the, the product space of the two um, strategy spaces. So, so in a, a matrix seeing the strategy spaces would actually be a space of all mixed strategies, so randomized strategies. Um, so that there may not be a Nash equilibrium in action, but there can be a Nash equilibrium in distributions over actions. Um, when we move to differentiable games, but this is Nash equilibrium in the action space, right? Uh, so, so we call the so, so it's Nash equilibrium in the strategy space. So, so the idea is that the actual interaction between the agents might be so. So imagine that these that X and Y are actually the parameters of a uh, neural network representing an individual control policy. Um, the uh, the actual Actions the player take may be uh, stochastic. That is, the policy itself may be stochastic, and, or it may um, depend on the uh, noise in the environment. So the actions the player take and the actions that the other players observe um, may uh, 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 may be stochastic, and, and, and are, but they're distributed. That they're uh, sample from distribution that depends on these uh, parameters x and y. So it's better. So in differential games, it's better to think of x and y as uh, parameters of the strategies rather than the strategies themselves. So yeah, so uh, differential Nash equilibriums are um, uh, uh, stationary are stationary points of simultaneous gradient descent. Um, unfortunately, there's no guarantee that simultaneous gradient descent will converge to a Nash uh, to a differential Nash equilibrium, uh, or that it will converge uh, uh, converge at all. Um, that even worse, uh, there's no guarantee that there will actually exist in any given differential uh, in any given differential game that there will actually exist a differential Nash equilibrium um, for any algorithm to converge to. So, as an example, the uh, uh, the game at the bottom where you have um, uh, the first player payoffs are x times y. Uh, the strategies in this case are just uh, the real numbers. Um, single player payoffs are uh, minus x times y. That game has no. It has a stationary point at zero zero. But that is not a um, um, a differential Nash equilibrium because the uh, uh, Hessians are not negative definite. Um, so that gets us into a uh, kind of an important aside, which is that uh, once we get into differential games, one of those powerful tools to analyze the long term behavior of the game um, and analyze the long term uh, convergence of different uh, learning strategies is uh, by mapping them to dynamical 
to continuous time dynamical systems. Um, so we have the uh, simultaneous gradient, the, oops, the simultaneous gradient of dynamics at the top. Um, what we can show is that uh, for uh, an appropriate choice of um, learning rate uh, schedule, in the long run, that these dynamics approximate um, are, or these dynamics uh, are approximated by uh, some limiting ordinary differential equation system, limiting uh, continuous time um, process. Um, and so going back to this idea of uh, differential Nash equilibria, um, these are actually uh, stable uh, the equilibria of the limiting of the E. So that they're not just a, a stationary points, but they're points that if you perturb them slightly, uh, you would still return to um, the equilibrium. And that's important for uh, things like stochastic gradient ascent, where there's always a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of noise. Um, so if you take nothing else away from this talk, um, one of the most useful and, and the general results that we leverage in this in the, our work and that uh, a lot of work on um, on um, uh, simultaneous on, on learning in games, um, but also a lot of work on like you know, so on analyzing stochastic gradient descent and its convergence properties is uh, this thing we call the ODE trick. Um, so what we can show uh, uh, it was originally proven by the name in the, the, the 90s, but um, um, there's been a lot of work, uh, work built on this since, but um, what we can show is that uh, for what we call a stochastic approximation, um, so basically this recursive uh, uh, setup here where you have, uh, uh, which can represent, you know, it could be uh, a gradient, but it can also be a, some, arbitrary, um, some arbitrary function. Any uh, uh, a stochastic approximation scheme with an appropriate choice of uh, a step size schedule um, will converge to what we call a chain transitive set of some limiting ordinary differential equation. And that what a chain transitive, and, and it's very technical, but what a chain transitive set basically is, is it's the uh, kind of minimal unit of convergence for arbitrary dimension dynamical systems. So any bounded um, uh, continuous time dynamical system uh, must converge to a chain transitive set. Of course, that chain transitive set might be essentially the entire space. Uh, so that doesn't, without additional information about, this, about the system, that is additional information about the, uh, the function H. Um, we can't say much more about convergence uh, beyond that, but there are a lot of games where there are a lot of um, settings where we have that additional information. And so the ODE trick allows us to say, you know, um, a particular algorithm or a particular, uh, let's say, joint learning setup will converge to um, certain uh, stationary points of the um, uh, of the uh, phase of, of the phase space. Um, and this works works for uh, the uh, deterministic simultaneous gradient descent, but it also works for stochastic gradient descent, um, which, uh, which which will be important later. Um, so as we said before, uh, there's not necessarily a, a differential a differentiable game, unlike a matrix game, doesn't necessarily have any Nash equilibria. Um, so that uh, has motivated a lot of people to look for, uh, to look at alternative solution concepts, not uh, just motivated by um, um, challenges in the uh, uh, ad hoc cooperation, but also um, that differentiable games can be used to model things like uh, learning uh, generative adversarial networks or um, certain uh, actor critic reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, so, that, so they're actually very, most of the, the research interest is actually motivated by um, kind of fundamental machine learning problems um, rather than multi-agent learning. Um, but one of the, uh, uh, what's been found is that the, the kind of natural solution concept for differentiable games is actually a local version of the stack of work that we saw before. Um, so uh, uh, in the differentiable setting, it, it, it becomes a little bit more complicated when we talk about the follower's best response. And so here we'll say uh, player one is the leader, player two is the follower. Um, we make the uh, additional assumption that the follower's best response to any, um, um, any leader action uh, is actually uh, unique and that the function um, um, defined uh, the, the function that yields this um, um, this best response to this function R of X here is a uh, itself twice continuous differential with respect to X. Um, and we get you can player two is a follower in this case, right? Sir? Player two is the follower. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you, you can general uh, uh, you can generalize this definition a little to say that you know R is the best response within some uh, uh, neighborhood of uh, of the current solution. So you can deal with cases where the function is the uh, follower's payoff function isn't necessarily convex. But for learning in these uh, learning stack of equilibria, 
we generally have to make something uh, akin to this uh, uniqueness um, assumption. Um, and so very similar to a differential Nash equilibrium, a differential stack of equilibrium assumes that uh, it is a stationary point of, um, assumes that, that a joint strategy is a stationary point of some um, um, gradient descent dynamics. The difference being that the leader is doing gradient uh, ascent on its payoff under its uh, the follower's best response, rather than a payoff under the follower's current strategy. The follower, of course, is just computing, doing gradient descent uh, under the uh, leader's current strategy. Um, and we impose the same uh, the same second order conditions to make sure that it's a stable uh, uh, stable equilibrium. Um, and so, how would we go about uh, if we make the assumption that the follower's um, um, best response is unique? How would we go about actually learning uh, or finding one of these um, um, uh, finding one of these uh, differential equilibrium? Somebody has a question. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, you probably can't see the hands. I thought for the benefit for, of the audience, where uh, Robert, I'm sure you have noticed by now that people are um, few people here are working on game theory. Would be very helpful. But your tutorial was great. So if you can say two sentences about the uh, kind of how general are the game theoretic concepts that you have introduced by now. Is are we talk? What they probably are wondering now is that is is this a pathological special case on in which you are going to say something or is this the mainstream of game theory so i mean i would say, I'd say that differential games are not the um as a topic or not are not the the, the the core of game theory at the moment they're very popular in um machine learning theory because uh, as i mentioned before they can be used to analyze things like um, um the, the trade generative adversarial models um they can be used to analyze um um, multi entry portable learning. So there's been a lot of work on uh, differentiable games where, uh, for example, something like uh, uh, AlphaGo or AlphaStar, where you're doing deep RL in a multi agent setting, you can treat um, the game itself, you can treat uh, Go or you can treat uh, uh, StarCraft, where you have um, agents controlled by neural policies, you can treat that as a differentiable game. So there are a lot of, um, and even things like uh, uh, reinforcement learning, where you have um, uh, both a, a policy network and a critic network. You can model that as a differential game. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, applications beyond multi agent systems. There's applications within multi agent systems and applications beyond multi agent systems where differential games are useful. And so that's why there's been, uh, in, in, in the past um, few years in particular, there's been a lot of interest in them, although not necessarily from, I would say, the core game theory community. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I, I believe the, but I, I was asking uh, for the benefit of others. So others may continue the question if this is not clear. But yeah, thanks. That was what I had, had in mind. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very, uh, it's very, uh, results on um, differentiable games uh, can find broad and some, somewhat surprising applications. Um, but we're really interested in the core. Uh, kind of game theoretic and multi agent questions here, um, which actually leads to, which as we'll see in the next few slides, um, leads to some uh, uh, divergence with a lot of the work that's been done previously on um, differential games. So, if we actually want to define, um, so we have a different differential game where uh, we know the payoffs, we know the payoff uh, functions for the players, and we just want to find a um, um, a differential uh, differential stack of our equilibrium. So, for example, we have a uh, uh, GAN with a, a data set um, and a network architecture, we can model that as a differentiable game. And then our differential stack of our equilibrium is essentially a, a solution to the um, the generative learning problem. Um, so the basic approach is to do uh, gradient ascent or gradient descent, depending on whether you're dealing with payoffs or losses, um, on this uh, hyper objective, which is basically um, the leader's payoff under the follower's assumed best response. Um, so the idea is to do gradient descent on, uh, gradient descent on that. Um, the challenge, of course, being that to compute this, we have to compute the gradient of the best response itself, uh, which even if we know the follower's payoff function, uh, there may not be a closed form expression for that best response. Um, oops. There we go. So the first thing we need is to estimate, um, before we estimate the gradient of the best response, uh, we need to estimate the best response itself. Um, and so the basic approach to that is to use a uh, is to use two time scales during learning. So we have the leader learn at a much slower rate than the uh, uh, than the follower, and that's generally implemented by having uh, two different learning rate schedules. Um, and uh, intuitively, the idea is that 
if you have the leader learn slow enough relative to the follower, the follower strategy will um, approximate or track the, uh, the, the best response to the leader's current strategy um, to a sufficient degree that you can actually use it as an approximation of the true best response. Um, and then the question, of course, becomes how do we compute the, uh, the derivative itself? Um, and there, there are several papers that do essentially this, that do very similar things, um, but there are two basic approaches. Uh, one is uh, called implicit differentiation, so it relies on something called the, um, uh, the implicit function theorem, which um, basically gives us an expression for the derivative of uh, the, um, um, the function giving us the uh, extremal points of a, um, uh, uh, of a function. So, so essentially, we have uh, this what we call bi-level optimization problem. Uh, we can compute the, uh, the we can get a closed form expression for the derivative of this best response, even if we don't have a closed form expression for the best response itself using the um, um, implicit function theorem. And so that's this uh, implicit differentiation. Uh, this nasty term here is, is what comes out of the implicit function theorem. Um, so that gives us a, if we have an exact uh, value for um, um, the best response, this is uh, exactly, the, and, and it satisfies some other um, smoothness conditions. Um, this gives us the exact, uh, uh, the exact gradient of that best response. Um, the other approach is this uh, uh, the iterative um, differentiation where we actually differentiate between, we differentiate through the entire uh, learning process itself. Um, so uh, a good example of that is the uh, learning with opponent learning awareness uh, update, um, where you actually differentiate through the, uh, a certain number of steps of gradient descent that the follower would do. Um, so you can instead of assuming that the follower would, uh, so the implicit differentiation assumes that the follower is um, trained at convergence, uh, uh, incremental differentiation um, assumes that the follower is trained for a finite number of steps. And so another example of this, I don't know how many people are familiar with um, the mammal uh, model agnostic mid learning. No? Yeah, so two people, okay. Um, so essentially the uh, iterative differentiation is basically mammal. Um, so you're differentiating through the learning process itself. So this gets us to where um, the, the ad hoc learning setting uh, makes things more difficult for us. So the ad hoc setting we care about makes things a little more complicated. And that's um, that both of these approaches to bi-level optimization um, require that we have knowledge of the uh, gradients of the follower and payoff functions. So essentially, we have to know uh, the follower's utilities, which is um, unrealistic in most ad hoc settings. Even if we knew, even if we assume that they had uh, utilities that were closely aligned with ours, the differences in their preferences uh, would be where um, um, misalignment it would be the differences in their preferences that would cause miscoordination in the first place. Um, and so those differences uh, would have to be accounted for in our, um, uh, in our learning process. So we don't have access to all the stuff uh, uh, in red here. So how do we do what is essentially bilateral optimization uh, without this information? Um, and so the basic idea that we came up with is uh, to use uh, gradient-free methods, so zero-order optimization, which essentially means that we um, estimate the gradients using only the, uh, uh, the values of, of the function in question. Um, in this case, the uh, hyper-objective, the leader's hyper-objective, uh, G of X. Um, and specifically, we use uh, what's called stochastic perturbation, uh, stochastic approximation, or SPSA, um, where we sample a small, uh, we sample a, a small perturbation that we, then, that we add to the current strategy. Um, and then we update the leader strategy uh, by evaluating uh, its, um, it's hyper objective at that uh, uh, at that perturbed strategy. So if it's uh, what happens is if we perturb the strategy a little bit and it improves, we move in that direction. If we perturb the strategy a little bit and it actually makes things worse, we move in the opposite direction. So it's a a zero to order approximation of gradient uh, gradient descent. Um, the problem, of course, is we still need the uh, uh, an estimate of the best response. Um, and so we use something very similar to what a lot of the bilateral optimization work does, but instead of that, where we have essentially two time scales, but instead of changing the learning rates, we uh, develop what we call a, a commitment schedule. Um, and so the idea is that we uh, generate a random perturbation of our current strategy. Um, we commit to playing that strategy for a certain number of time steps. Um, and we, uh, and a number of time steps uh, uh, in general will grow over time. Um, and then we use the followers uh, current strategy after uh, that commitment interval um, as, a, as an approximation of their best response. And then we can do the same uh, SPSA update. We call this, uh, uh, just to be funny, we, we call this uh, high C, so hierarchical learning uh, with commitments. Um, 
Unfortunately, because we're using uh, SPSA, and as the name suggests, SPSA is one of these stochastic approximation schemes, um, we can apply the ODE trick directly to prove things about its uh, convergence properties. Um, so we can prove, uh, in general, that uh, a heist that just like um, the uh, high, the hierarchical gradient method, I mean, the, um, the implicit gradient methods that we saw before that use the follower, that have access to the follower payoff function, um, the IC update, which does not, uh, will still converge uh, to chain transitive sets of the um of the uh the of the um that have the dynamic uh, defined by gradient ascent on the um on the leader's hyper objective uh which in general but which uh uh in general will be differentiable uh, uh differential stack of equilibria um they're not necessarily in the, all cases um now one, one important point to, to actually prove this bound is we also have to uh, balance the we call the tracking error, so the error between um, the uh, follower's actual strategy and the true best response, um, and it requires making uh, it requires basically more assumptions uh, on the um, follower's payoff function, which then inform our choice of uh, of uh, commitment schedules. So, for example, if the follower's payoff structure is um, if all payoff, uh, the follower's payoff function is uh, strongly convex. Um, for all leader strategies, uh, then we can use a very slowly growing commitment schedule uh, that grows at approximately um, log uh, log t, where t is the number of uh, of uh, uh, commitment intervals, so leader lower updates. And so it's not all math. Um, we have uh, some very simple experiments in the uh, in a very simple differential game, the Bruno duopoly um, a model of uh, an economic basically an economic model of how uh, uh, a market leader sets prices. Um, and so here we have uh, player one. Um, using the high C update and player two using gradient descent. Uh, and what we can see is that initially player one, um, the or player two, the follower, maximizes their own payoff. So they increase their uh, 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 production to uh, take advantage of the fact that the follower is not producing as much as they, uh, the leader is not producing as much of a good as they can. And so prices are artificially high. Over time, the uh, leader of this blue curve slowly increases their, um, uh, their own uh, the production, so the amount of some good they produce, um, which in turn, through the uh, uh, price model, reduces the, um, the um, reduces the price that you can sell the goods for, and forces the um, the, um, the follower to reduce their production volumes. And so initially, uh, so initially the uh, the follower is doing is doing very well; they're making most of the profits. But as the uh, the leader um, improves their strategy, they force the the uh, uh, the follower to reduce to a uh, uh, an equilibrium level. So this these final strategies correspond to the uh, differential uh, differential stack of our equilibrium of this game. So then, I have questions. Yeah. You go back to the last last page. Okay, so awesome. yeah, so here, so when you uh when you do the stochastic approximation, so do you change to um, control only leader, right? Sorry, I don't think I to so, so you only decide uh, leader's action. So. so, so the so the assumption is there are two independent agents. So high C only controls one agent. Yeah. Um, and so it's so yeah, it's only controlling the leader strategies. Yeah. There's another agent controlling the follower strategies. But you can't. Um, so you can't decide another agent's action. So no. Yeah. Okay. Not not in the uh, that, that's what we, so that's uh, an important part of the uncoupled setup is that we can't control both player strategies simultaneously. So, so again, we'll be able. Um, yeah, maybe you can just go ahead. Yeah. So the, the last thing I want to talk about was so, so we've um uh, so the stack of the stack of equilibrium has uh, not just in the context of differential game, uh, differential games, but also in um, um in uh, matrix games and in the uh, reinforcement learning settings, it has been proposed as a um as a natural solution uh, as a natural solution concept for um uh, cooperation. The problem, of course, is that to find the stack of equilibrium, you have to um, agree in advance of who's going to be the leader and who's going to be the follower, uh, which is, of course, uh, in many games, it's a lot more advantageous to be the leader than just to be the follower. Of course, there are also games where you have the reverse is true. Um, say, rock, paper, scissors, you really don't want to be the one going first. Um, but um, the question becomes, can agents actually negotiate these roles online in a reasonable way? Um, and so this is something we're just beginning to explore, but the basic idea is that uh, we treat learning, we treat identifying your role as a mental learning problem. 
Um, so essentially, in addition to their underlying strategies, the players each maintain a uh, meta strategy parameterized by just a single uh, a scalar value, and um, at each uh, uh, we call negotiation interval. So it's a so we have the commitment intervals, um, we have the individual uh, uh, game steps that the players play against one another, we have the commitment intervals. Now we have these larger negotiation intervals. Um, each negotiator negotiation interval, uh, the players choose with, with probability dependent on their current meta strategy whether they want to be a leader or a follower, so whether they want to use the high C update or they, they want to use uh, just the, the faster gradient descent updates. Um, and the idea is that we can actually optimize um, the uh, uh, these meta strategies using a scheme like SPSA. Um, this is where we don't have the derivatives of the payoffs. And what they optimize here is the average payoff you get over um, the, the, uh, the negotiation interval uh, under your current um, your current loading up to either high C or uh, uh, or um, gradient ascent. And this is before we can show that this would uh, we under certain circumstances can show that this would converge um, to uh, a limiting ODE. The uh, uh, challenging point is that this can only be shown when um, the long term A, which is the long term outcome of loading process, is independent of initial conditions. Because if you think about doing negotiation, because you're doing you have this underlying loading process. Uh, each time you start a negotiation, or also each time you try out new roles, um, your initial conditions or the initial strategies you're starting grading this and from uh, may be different. So in the general case, um, there's not necessarily a guarantee that it will converge to a particular um, uh, limiting ODE. And the other question is, even if it does converge to a limiting ODE, uh, does that um, uh, does that ODE uh, uh, lead to conversion to specific leader follower roles? So um, in conclusion, the uh, other uh, open questions, um, in addition to the questions around uh, uh, characterizing which games uh, role negotiation will actually succeed in, there's also questions of um, how do we handle, uh, as we said before, um, you know, we're assuming unique best responses, how do we handle non-unique best responses, so non-convex follower objectives, um, which is a, a broader question to the viable optimization community as well. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a tie into role, negoti role negotiation is, uh, can we improve? So, so as we saw in the exam in the uh, experiment, um, the uh, the leaders loading up is very slow, uh, and in many cases there may be uh, a value in allowing the leader to initially uh, just learn via a gradient ascent. So if you're in say a reinforcement learning context, uh, you can probably learn uh, uh, feature layers um, without uh, worrying about um, um, game theoretic concerns. Um, so the question is, can we uh, intelligently switch between the faster gradient descent update? And the slower um, hierarchical update would actually try to exploit the learning behavior of the uh, of the partner. Um, so that's my uh, that's my talk. Uh, it's about forty five minutes. Um, and thank you to my uh, my collaborators, uh, uh, Merck, who's on the call, uh, Sammy, I think all of you know, as well as uh, Perka and uh, Brian Dalio. Um,